Your Vigo's rolling, Audacity's rolling. Yeah, and if you want me, I'll do another slap of the hands so the video and audio are synced up. Where are you, Phil? I am in house in Nottingham. So, um, like everybody else, locked down and um, having a fun time being socially distanced. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, how about you, Brady? I am, I'm the same. I'm locked in a room editing videos, but that's what I normally do anyway. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of writing done, so it's it's not so bad, you know, obviously a lot of people are, you know, suffering in terms of, you know, family members, etc. I've got to admit my family's okay, um, even my more elderly relatives are okay, so, you know, it could be a lot worse. I'm getting some writing done, I'm getting some... You know, the usual standard, my in inbox is just as full, if not more full than it used to be. So um, in some ways, this is, you know, surreal. In other ways, it's almost business as usual. Phil, a lot of scientists and mathematicians I spoke to when the lockdown started said, this is great, I can catch up on lots of writing and papers that I've been sitting in a drawer for months. But then they've been telling me I've been stuck on so many Zoom calls and meetings and other administrative things that take lots of time. I'm getting even less work than done than before on the writing yeah. side. That's that's a good point, Brady. That's how that's really how I feel. Um, and it's not just it's not just the Zoom calls and the, the that side of things. It's there's something about the the, the atmosphere and the environment and the le the lack of structure sometimes to the day. That certainly I feel my, my productivity has gone down, but, you know, productivity isn't everything, as I say, you know, healthy and, and, and well, so I've got to count blessings, as it were. Um, and the other thing as well is I'm sort of glad I don't spend as much time on social media as I used to, because I'm sure I'd get very sick of people going, look at this thing I made, and look at this thing I cooked, and look at this thing I painted, and look at I've solved all the world's problems in during lockdown. That could get very infuriating after a little while, I think. Phil, how did the timing of the lockdown come for you in terms of what was happening in your labs? Like, were you, were you on the brink of a great discovery? Was it a good time for the lab to have to close down anyway, or...? No, it's never a good time for the lab to close down. I was actually on research leave at the University of Alberta. I was in Canada with Bob Walco's lab when, when the whole sort of lockdown started. And I had to cut that research leave short and come back instead of spending two weeks in Edmonton, University of Alberta. I had to come back uh, a week early. Um, so, and then the labs are completely shut down. The pumps aren't even running on the vacuum system. So we'll be doing a lot of baking when we go back after the lockdown. Can you just explain what do you mean by you'll have to do a lot of baking? I thought, I thought everyone was doing their baking now while they're stuck at home. <laughs> yeah. So for us, um, to get a very, very good vacuum, we have to heat the entire ultra high vacuum system up to 150 degrees. And we call that process baking. And after there's going to be a prolonged period when the systems will be not pumped. They're at a static, what we'd call a static vacuum. So they're sitting there in principle, the vacuum should be okay-ish. But they'll certainly need to be baked to get back to the levels of vacuum that we really, really need to start the experimental program again. When that happens, I don't don't know. Nobody knows really. Purely from a science perspective, how catastrophic is this for science? I know a lot of industries, this is like, this is killing a lot of industries. Is science a bit more resilient to this kind of shutdown? This is obviously going to halt science for um, quite some time. You know, exper I'm an experimentalist. Um, we can do some work, obviously, in terms of computer simulations. We're working with machine learning, so that can happen offline. But in terms of experiments, no experiments are happening at the moment. For experimental postdocs and for experimental researchers, that's a, a, that's a real issue. And... Um, Hopefully, you know, they're going to be able to get back in the lab and hopefully it will be in terms of when university research starts up again. I would very much hope it will be the experimentalists who will be getting back, you know, allowed back on campus um, first because they are the ones that are really suffering from, you know, not being able to have access to the, the science they can do. We do a lot of, as I say, a lot of simulations, we do a lot of machine learning, so that can happen offline and uh, uh, that can happen away from the campus. But um, the core of what we do is basically just entirely shut down at the moment. 
Phil, a lot of industries have been able to keep working as long as they're very careful about how they locate their people. Is the reason you've had to shut your lab because of a university directive to stay off campus, or did you think your lab couldn't work specifically? Uh, it's a university directive. It's a school directive. We, we're off campus. I will see how that goes in, you know, over the next few weeks in terms of a staged sort of reintroduction or a staged allowance and getting people back into the lab. Um, in our lab, I think we could have a mechanism whereby we'd ensure that there were, you know, just one person in the lab and we could have shifts and people could come in and social distancing could still be, um, you know, going on. Um, the problem is, though, of course, is when that's not just our lab, when it's every lab in the in the department and every lab in the university, then I can understand the university's concerns. Then it becomes a lot more difficult to manage. Could our lab continue? Absolutely. But um, we're not the only lab there. Phil, I know recently you've been having a big role at the university with admissions of new students. And that seems to be something that has been on your mind a bit about how this shutdown is affecting student intake, the new students, current students. Can you tell me about where your concerns have been and how, how they've been resolving in your head? So I was, under, as you say, I was undergraduate admissions tutor, which means that I oversaw um, applications from high school students, from secondary school students, A-level students, AP physics students, etc., etc., um, uh, in, into our courses. I uh, did that for five years. Last year, I passed that role over to my colleague, Megan Gray. Many of you in 60 Symbols will know Megan very well and Deep Sky Videos will know Megan very well. Megan and I obviously have the same um, concerns, but what... And we are would want to just want to get the message out there to those students who are obviously going to be worried. They haven't... They won't be doing the exams like previous students have. They might be a little bit worried about... Um, uh, just how, what it's going to be like the first year at university. And of course, we don't want you to panic. We don't want you to worry. We are well aware that, of course, this is a, a completely different, unprecedented situation, surreal in many ways. And we, of course, are going to make, um, you know, make sure that we take account of that. It feels like there are two issues here. One is how you're going to decide which students get admitted if they haven't taken the normal exams. And the second issue is for the ones you do take in, what is their level of preparedness going to be in terms of, you know, their underlying mathematical and physics ability because they've missed the last part of their final year of school? First of all, in terms of how you decide who to admit, do you even know how that's going to be done yet? Or is that being decided by other powers? Or We have some idea. That's obviously going to be decided by, by government overall, Department of Education overall. It will be on... A levels are not going ahead in the UK. Um, even GCSE exams are not going ahead. So we, it will have to be on the basis of predicted grades. It will have to be on the basis of of whatever coursework is available to help dis, um, teachers make decisions, etc. And we are just going to have to take those uh, predicted grades on board and make our decisions on the basis of those those, those grades. Um, Megan can tell you a lot more about this. I must admit, I am not. I do not envy at all Megan's situation at the moment in terms of being an admissions tutor during this particular period. Um, but as I said, that's that's largely what we're going to have to do. Um, with regard to preparedness, my, the key message I want to get across is don't panic. And the best Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where do not panic. We are well aware that these are unprecedented circumstances. We are well aware that students are going to be really anxious and nervous in terms of, well, I haven't done the, the, the exams. I haven't had the same preparation as other years have had. We know that. And um, just thought it would be a good idea to, you know, suggest a few things just to keep the brains ticking over in terms of lockdown so everybody doesn't go stir crazy everybody doesn't start crawling the walls in terms of what physics you could do the type of things that we might recommend i hope this i hope you're going to recommend 60 symbols phil absolutely the first on my list brady <laughs> is of course 60 symbols and all those other wonderful brady Harren channels including number file and deep sky videos <laughs> and periodic videos even though it causes me great pain to have to mention the chemists but there we go um yeah so definitely there are all those wonderful uh, online resources there are there, there are other videos on physics that you can find other than brady's other channels are yeah, available. Other channels are available. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I may well, if it's okay with you, Brady, I'll, I'm going to write up a, a, a short blog post on this and I'll just put a range of different links in, in there. I guess the first thing 
to say is a sort of you know keep on keep on doing what you like about physics you know keep on you know watching those videos but also reading and I'll, I can certainly recommend a whole host of different books there are a couple of websites I'd really like to re recommend though first of all there's something called um, Isaac Physics Isaac as an Isaac Newton which is a University of Cambridge based uh, online project funded funded by the Ogden Trust which has also actually funded 60 symbols in the past and um that's a really great resource for um, preparing both at A level, but also in, at, at university level. So if you want to get an idea or you want to get some um, uh, physics problems and thinking about just where the, le the, the level is going to be when you enter university, it's really well worth taking a look at, at, at Isaac Physics. It's also quite fun. The Institute of Physics also has a really great site, which is called spark.iop.org. In terms of what else can you do beyond online resources and, and reading, of course, one thing I would suggest, really heavily suggest, for those of you into, who are into coding, code. And for those of you who aren't into coding, start coding. Honestly, you will. It's, fine, it's great fun. It can be infuriating at times, but in terms of really f focusing you in terms of learning real physics and how to code that physics and, and to write a physics simulation that's really good preparation for any university degree and moreover it's really good in terms of, of understanding the core the core physics as an undergraduate um i and i've said this before in in, in other videos brady but it, it's worth repeating my mantra was if i can't code it i don't understand it because for coding a simulation or coding a piece of physics really focuses you down on what are the core aspects here. So a whole wide range of different projects I could suggest. Um, and even sort of there's the, the mathematical side, away from the physics, there's things like the Mandelbrot set, there's things like the cube roots of unity, fractals, there's a whole wide range of really fun projects you could do that will keep your math skills um up to, to up to, to grade as well. Just reading between the lines there, I feel like I feel like maybe you're even suggesting sometimes when students come through from school, at the best of times, maybe they could turn up their coding a little bit. I yeah, absolutely. Um, so your math skills are important, but also it's increasingly important to 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 start getting into coding skills. And obviously, computer files are a great place to start, but. As well as watching videos, it's like learning a musical instrument, particularly with coding, but also particularly with physics. You have to, you know, it's practice. And it's, it's, it's the difference between sort of passively watching a video and actively doing something. And that actively doing something will really sort of embed th these ideas. And a huge area, not just in physics, but in all of the sciences, in, right across the board, out of science, in economics, in practically every area of, of obviously machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so much of physics is now at that interface with, with computer science in terms of machine learning. And that's, you know, the, there are quite a few sites out there and there's some great um, computer file videos on, on neural nets and machine learning. And thinking about how that translates into physics is, is also um, something very worthwhile to do. There's a great book, by the way. Actually, I've got it here. So there's this great book, which is not so much about the details of the algorithms, etc., etc., but it's a really good read in terms of machine learning and um, called Rage Inside the Machine by a guy called Robert Smith, not the singer in The Cure, the band The Cure, but actually a, a professor at UCL at University College London. And that's, that's well worth a read in terms of the broader scope of how many areas machine learning is feeding into. Is there a particular language that one should pick up if one's going to just start saying, OK, I'm going to learn to code? Where do you, there's so, I thought there are a whole bunch of languages, aren't there? Python is a good place to start. Python's open source. It's freely available. It's a good, really good place to start. Um, but even... I, I like, I've started to get back into JavaScript quite a lot. JavaScript is a lot of fun because you can embed simulations into a browser. And in fact, all you need for JavaScript is basically Notepad and a browser. That's really it. And that then you can start coding that way. And it's a lot of fun. You can tweak. You can really set up an environment. You can have buttons and sliders and change the parameters. And, you know, there are things like diffusion. There are sort of some standard standard projects which are still a lot of fun in terms of diffusion limited aggregation the icing model there's a that are you know even things like the simple pendulum 
if you apply a force to it, you can code that and actually that will behave chaotically. Not randomly, chaotically in the true physics sense. It's, it, it, it's, it's a really neat manifestation of chaos. That project alone, that piece of code alone on the simple pendulum, a driven simple pendulum, that could keep you going for days. You know, and in fact, that's, you know, that's often one of the projects that's set at, at undergraduate level as well. So um, there's a range of different different projects. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll, in the blog post, I'll, I'll, I'll list a few of these. Phil, the lockdown as we record now hasn't been going for that long. It's been a few weeks. And I know most school students are still having interaction with their teachers via technology and, and home learning. Mm hmm. I feel that how much can they be missing out on in their last few weeks of school and if it's been topped up by home learning? I mean, this can't be that big a problem. Oh, no, it's quite it's a it's it's a it's a pretty big problem. Well, first of all, the exams not happening is is um, a big problem. And so there's not that intense drive and there's not that intense motivation um, at this end of the school year for GCSEs and A-levels. My daughter's actually a GCSE. She would have been doing her GCSE exams this year. And in terms of A-level students, it's exactly the same. There's not this same drive. They are doing homework. The teachers are doing an incredible job in keeping them motivated, etc. But with the best will in the world, they're not going to the classroom. The day isn't as structured. They, it's not the same environment. It's not the same sort of overall ethos. So, and... Again, I'm even finding it sometimes in terms of productivity and motivation very, very difficult. So, you know, students are also going to find that in, in under these circumstances. So um, it, it is very different, I would say, compared to, to previous years. And a lot of stuff gets crammed in, does it, in those in those last months and gets like solidified in your brain. That is like that is a key time, is it? Yes, it is. These last few months when the run up to exams are absolutely key. Absolutely key. When do when you have to excuse my ignorance? When would new students be starting? If everything like best case scenario, I know there's so much doubt around everything at the moment. But best case scenario, when will the new students come in? It would be that it's the it's the second last week of September for us. It varies a little bit across the UK, but for Nottingham, it would be the second last week in September. Would be the sort of induction week, and then lectures would start last week of September, right at the beginning of October. Whether we're going to hit that is, is big, big uncertainty. We'll get people on the case. I'll link to your blog and all the stuff that people can look at. Um, one last question then. While everyone's locked down, it's always a good chance to explore new music. Any music recommendations? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, wow, 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 wow. Thank you for that, Brady. So myself and a uh, couple of friends, uh, James and Pete, have been playing this game, which is recommend a new band or a new album um, uh, every uh, every day. I'm giving you ten minutes, Phil. I'm giving you ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, there's a, there's a whole host of new music. One of my favourite new bands is a band called Wilderun, who managed to mix the most metal of metal, blast beats, etc., with folk music, basically. And um, Pink Floyd harmonies. For anybody who's a fan of Opeth, I w recommend Wilderun. They're a Boston band. Um, in terms of old albums, if you haven't heard of King's X, go out and get, download, beg, borrow, steal an album called Out of the Silent Planet. And there's a third recommendation, Jellyfish. Absolute power pop band, 90s. Oh, a huge debt to Lennon and McCartney, um, but then who doesn't? But they do the Beatles better than the Beatles did the Beatles. You'll understand when you hear the albums. Cla absolutely class band. All right. Yeah. Thank you for that, Brady. You heard it here first. <laughs> thank you for thank you, Professor Moriarty, and uh, for your words of words of wisdom. Thank you, Brady. Thanks a lot. Good luck. This is the X-ray optics, and we need to be able to get the, those X-rays onto our sample to focus them down. The synchrotron is about ten billion times brighter than the sun. So this is an immense engineering challenge. 